Welcome to Nordic by Nature, a podcast on ecology today inspired by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness, who coined the term deep ecology. Ness was quick to identify that language and the way we communicate plays a huge role in shaping our behaviour, how we view ourselves as humans and our role in the world. In this episode on narratives, we hear from four people working to shape more constructive narratives of our relationship to nature in order to increase environmental protection. First, we hear from Tom Crompton, founder of the Common Cause Foundation in the UK, whose research into values shows that the dominant narrative of the selfishness of humankind is deeply flawed. Then we hear from Paul Allen, from the Centre of Alternative Technology in Wales. Paul presents a positive and attainable vision of the future. We then hear from Dr Yuan Pan, whose work integrating biodiversity into the natural capital framework at Cambridge University aims to help businesses and policymakers start understanding the direct benefits from acting as stewards of the environment and nature's resources. Finally, we hear from rewilding expert Paul Jepson, who is also active in science communication, particularly in the area of nature recovery, science policy interfaces, and public participation. Paul currently works for the UK-based consultancy Ecosulis Limited. My name's Tom Crompton, and I direct a small not-for-profit called Common Cause Foundation, which works on uh, people's values, what matters to people, what shapes what matters to people, and our perception of what matters to our fellow citizens. As soon as you begin to ask that question of what it is that underpins public appetite for ambitious change, uh, you're led to uh, social psychology and uh, amongst other things, um, the, the social psychology of, of values, of human motivations. There's a great deal of, of data on people's own values. There's very little data on people's perception of their fellow citizens' values. And we've used a standard uh, values questionnaire, the Schwartz Value Survey. So we've used that to ask people about their own values. And then we've asked them to think about a typical fellow citizen to respond about the values that they feel that typical fellow citizen holds to be important. What we find is that with regard to people's own values, people tend to place particular importance on what we call compassionate values. Uh, So these are values of friendship and kindness and social justice and equality and honesty, probably also include self-direction values of curiosity. So people hold those values to be very important, and they attach relatively low importance to a set of values which are psychologically, stand in psychological opposition to those compassionate values. We call them self-interest values, and these include values of uh, well, concern for fin- financial success or public image or social status. Around about three quarters of people attach more importance to those compassionate values than they do to the self-interest ones. Then when we move on to ask people about what values they feel a typical fellow citizen holds to be important, we find that there's a widespread misunderstanding that people typically underestimate the importance that a typical fellow citizen places on those compassionate values and overestimate the importance that they place on the self-interest value. That doesn't incidentally seem to be as a result of reporting bias. You might imagine that Uh, A participant is perhaps reluctant to acknowledge the importance that they place on those self-interest values, but we're able to control that, and that doesn't seem to be the case. And what we find is that the more inaccurate a person's perception of a typical fellow citizen's values, uh, the less connected that person is likely to feel to their community, uh, the less likely they are to have uh, participated civically recently, the less likely they are to have voted. Um, The less supportive they are 
um, for action on a range of social and environmental issues, for example, homelessness or climate change or inequality, and the lower their well-being. Our typical fellow citizens care more about one another and the wider world than we might imagine. And we project that were we successful in conveying a more authentic understanding of what a typical fellow citizen or a typical person holds to be important, then we would anticipate that that would help to strengthen sense of community, strengthen commitment to civic participation, strengthen public support for action on social and environmental issues, and strengthen people's well-being. I think we've perhaps been told for so long that we're essentially atomized, self-interested individuals out to kind of optimize our own outcomes for our own selfish purposes. Uh, you know, it's such a dominant um, understanding of human nature that runs right through, right through the natural sciences, right through the social sciences, that we've come to believe it. And of course, it's something that when we see people interacting with one another in large numbers, it's very often in a commercial environment, the kind of environment that we know tends to do more to cue or prime uh, those more self-interested values. What we've begun to do is to ask what kind of organization might be able to work to convey to people a deeper appreciation of the concern of the importance that most people attach on those compassionate values. If an organization identifies a sense of social purpose in deepening the feeling of community and well-being among the, the audiences that it engages, then I think there are a wide range of ways in which it can begin to communicate with those audiences in ways which will facilitate that. I think it would be simply could become part of a pattern of how an organization communicates with its stakeholders. So one area in which has been real interest in this work is in the um, in the city's resilience uh, team. So the team that's actually uh, working to think about how the people of Greater Manchester respond to disasters. And of course, traditionally, that's work which has tended to focus on the practicality of disaster or emergency response. But increasingly, there's recognition that of the importance of working upstream. That actually, it's how citizens respond in an emergency. It's the values which come to the fore in the course of those responses, uh, which are so important in uh, shaping how collectively a disaster or an emergency is met. There's also an opportunity to develop, I suppose, a, a sensitivity to seeing where those values are already in action and then subtly or gently drawing attention to them. You know, so often we don't recognize those values in action when we encounter them. The important thing to do, perhaps, is to develop a sensitivity to seeing those values in action and then um, a creativity and um, imagination in thinking about how they might be made more salient. And that's going to be different in every different organizational context. If you think about the reverse side of it, if you like, the, um, the perception, the misperception that uh, most people are driven primarily by uh, self-interested or selfish urges, that's something which is implicit in so many of the ways in which we're communicated at uh, by such a diverse range of different organizations. And it's not that that's coordinated in any way. It's just that it becomes so deeply embedded in our understanding of what it is that motivates one another, that those are the motivations we reach for and, and tacitly connect with in the course of communicating with people. And the question that really interests me is then how do you move beyond the situation in which people are defining themselves to a common interest or a common concern in the ultimate sense, by seeing ourselves as human beings, we recognize that there are values of concern for one another and the wider world that are an inherent part of that identity. My name is Paul Allen. I'm an electrical engineer by training. And in 1988, I left Liverpool and came to work at the Centre for Alternative Technology in Machenflath in Clinwern Quarry, 
And I've worked here now for 30 years, doing a whole range of different jobs. The Centre for Alternative Technology was set up in the early 70s to help rethink the role of technology for society, to make technology work better for a citizen, but within the limits of the planet. So we began experiments with a live lab, with a real living on-site community, looking at how we provide food, how we deal with waste, how we make the lights come on, in different ways to try and make them more resilient, done in ways that the people living with them better understand them, and to reduce our ecological impact. But back then, what was being talked about by the alternative movement was very far from the mainstream thinking. But it was at the cutting edge. And part of it was to have a holistic approach, not just to focus on electricity or heat, but to think about land use, to think about food production, to think about composting and waste, and how all of those different systems can intersect as well. So that thinking has progressed over 45, nearly 50 years at CAT. And now, increasingly, it's moving into the mainstream because the mainstream fully understands the physical limits of the world, but also how to give better value, better returns for human beings in return for what they're looking for. We have to recognize now we are in a climate emergency. We don't have the option of business as usual for another 15 or 20 years. Now is the time. So that's the sort of thing I would suggest, the process that needs to go through in all of business and industry, almost to light a little candle as the voice of the future generations around their boardroom and think, are we really behaving in the way that we need to? to respond to where we actually are in terms of human beings providing for their needs on Earth. Uh, I think corporate social responsibility means looking at the, not just the footprint of the business, but also the mind print of the business, looking at the, the marketing and the advertising and how that affects social values. And the idea of associating, to be a successful family or to be uh, an attractive male, you have to have a big car, is something that really needs to be challenged and something the car industry needs to take responsibility for that. Because people do need personal mobility because we've got to take the kids to see grandmother. But there's ways of doing that with buying the service of having a car when you need it rather than owning one that can foster reliable cars that are designed to last longer, where that sort of resilience and that longevity actually helps the business model, rather than designing short-life cars that are far bigger and heavier than they need to be, but backing up that by huge amounts of merchandising and advertising and product placement. So we need to challenge those norms. What's more, the Welsh Government is supporting people who use transport, public transport. There's a, a free bus passes the road end now on Saturdays and Sundays that can take me to Aberystwyth or to Bangor for free to encourage more people to think about public transport. We've also reached a point in terms of data harvesting where anybody in any town or county can put up a map where everybody puts the journey they want to do so that the local transport providers know who needs to travel where and when and what time so we can develop public transport systems that meet the needs of the citizens. So we need to put in place infrastructure systems and support systems that help people move away from individual car ownership and help them begin to build new ways of relating to transport. When we're talking about delivering a utopia, we're talking about just changing the infrastructure system so human beings can continue to evolve within a safe platform for the next two, three, four, five hundred years. But technology has to work within a plan that works and is driven by and has social license from citizens. We can't have citizens' lifestyles driven by what works for technology and 
the profit of corporate interest, that's a sort of shift in understanding that I think needs to really get out. There is an enormous amount of really interesting, really exciting good practice happening. I'd recommend you have a little look at the Ashton Award winners website, where there's some really good old videos of some fabulous projects that are really happening on the ground now. We just need to be like bees and cross-fertilize, cross-pollinate these projects and help other people find them. Because basically, the problem we face is carbon lock-in, how we deliver housing, transport, food, light bulbs coming on has co-evolved with fossil fuels over 150 years at least. So we need to challenge those complex intertwined relationships. And one of the most exciting ways that we see that is smart, innovative, community scale, city scale projects. One example is something like um, Energy Local where if you're running a community hydro, you don't sell your electricity to the grid at 5p a unit, then the house next door buys it at 15p a unit. They've got a virtual private wire network set up where people around the community hydro can buy the electricity cheaper and the hydro gets a better price from it and it builds relationships with citizens. Or another good example might be at municipal level where Nottingham's running a project called Robin Hood Energy. And essentially it's run by the council for the people. They buy and sell electricity as affordable as possible to bring the price down for the cities and just not them. That's an example of doing things for municipal benefits, not for corporate profit. There's so much good stuff out there and it is beginning to, to grow. The trick is to cross-fertilize it so everybody can find out and access the really good ideas, so we're not all starting from the beginning. There's been technological advances in energy storage, but there's also been big advances in restorative agriculture and rethinking how we can revitalize natural systems to increase their carbon capture, as well as improving resilience and soil quality. I think one of the biggest challenges we face in rising to the climate emergency challenge is the people who are thinking about the solutions are quite often in their own individual silos of expertise. But there are so many co-benefits in thinking about energy, food, transport buildings together in a single scenario. It also means some very, very big systemic changes as well. We need to think about how we're supporting land use, what we're using land for, we're drawing upon our indigenous wisdom of tradition. Because if we look back at farms in Wales or in Scotland or in England over 30, 40, 50, 100 years, we can find fabulous records of how we used to farm with more cereals, more crops, more oats, more turnips, more vegetables. And we can draw upon that wisdom, not to go back in time, but to rethink farm use for the 21st century in a way that helps us understand what the land has produced in the past and what land can produce in the future, so that we can begin to produce a more healthy mix of foods for better matches what human beings need to eat, whilst also restoring soil quantity, quality, and thinking about resilience. Because we live in turbulent times, there's turbulent climate times, there's turbulent political times, and having more resilience built into your system and more local connections and stronger skills bases that are more flexible can help give us a better system to pass over to future generations. Well, I think it's very important to look at the, the history of seeing ourselves as part of nature. We are nature protecting ourselves rather than we are environmentalists protecting something that's out there called nature that is nothing to do with us. Nature provides for all of our, provides the oxygen, it provides the food, it provides everything that we need. We are part of it and we are part of each other. And that shift of seeing that interconnection, I think, is fundamental in helping change the behaviors that we need to see, but also making us happier, healthier human beings. And partly, I think there's cultural norms that need to be rethought, the idea that 
peasants work on the land and people who work on the land are poor and people who work in the urban environment are rich, successful people. It doesn't really work out if you look at how people's happiness is measured. People's happiness is directly related to their connections with nature and their sense of meaning in their job. And then they feel that what they're actually doing has social and natural worth rather than just churning out money. Hello everyone, I'm Yuan Pan and I work with uh, Professor Bascavira here at the Cambridge Conservation Institute on natural capital, particularly incorporating biodiversity into natural capital accounts. Personally, I'm quite a pessimistic person, but when it comes to conservation science, I think we are all quite optimistic. I think most of us, yeah, are optimistic. Natural capital essentially is an economic term. So natural capital is the stock of the world's natural resources. The way I see it is a different way of framing the narrative of protecting nature. A story that will hopefully impact with policymakers and businesses. What we're trying to say is that nature has value towards human society. And some of that can be economic value, but it can also be other types of value as well. So within this research, we are only focusing on natural capital, but of course I know about human capital and social capital. We're also concerned with other types of value, like cultural values and kind of the intrinsic value of nature. Nature has value in itself, regardless of whether humans are here or not. So natural capital definitely started after ecosystem services emerged. So people tend to use the two terms interchangeably nowadays. So ecosystem services are the benefits that we get from nature. So it's like a flow of benefits, but natural capital is the stock. And for a lot of businesses, they are doing ecosystem services valuation or natural capital valuation. And I think that's helping them to highlight that nature is kind of providing a lot of resources for them and they need to keep a resilient and sustainable ecosystem. Otherwise, for a lot of businesses, their raw materials or products will eventually collapse, basically. I would say essentially the terms are anthropocentric, so they are human based because the definition for both of them is they're benefiting human society. But what I have found in my research is that in fact, by using these kind of terms, you're resonating more with businesses and policymakers because unfortunately we do live in a society where most people just concentrate on economic returns and monetary values. And these kind of terms, when you talk to businesses, their eyes tend to light up. And the kind of conservation that I did before, a lot of businesses, they just tend to shy away from that, I think. Biodiversity is a very difficult topic within natural capital accounting. And my project is trying to incorporate biodiversity in. So currently, lots of people just ignore biodiversity. And I think part of the reason is, even as an ecologist, it's very hard when I say, like, what do you think when I say biodiversity? It can mean a lot of different things. I'm trying to improve the situation with incorporating biodiversity by just saying that it does have a lot of value, but the values are harder to measure because it's, the relationships are non-linear and also they can't be very easily monetary valued. Everyone's hearing this situation about the beast disappearing. And one of the things that people do pick up on when they talk about natural capital or ecosystem services is that bees are very vital for pollination. But when you look at the research, we can't predict what will happen in the future with climate change and with the extreme weather conditions. So in the future, we might need those other species that currently don't seem to be performing any functions. But this is the other issue we've been talking about, that for climate change, there's, you know, a kind of a very specific protection goal, like either one degrees or two degrees. And part of the reason that I think there's been more focus on climate change compared to biodiversity protection per se is because climate change is quite easy to conceptualize. 
basically you have a degree goal that you're working towards. We currently don't have a very specific protection goal. So the first question is, how much biodiversity do we need to sustain basic functions and processes so that we don't die as a society? But the second question is, how much biodiversity do we want? And that's not necessarily the same. A lot of people would like a very specific protection goal for biodiversity protection, just like climate change. It's very difficult to actually arrive at a threshold value to say, how much is it we actually want to protect? We have a lot of research and we have a lot of data, but perhaps there's no kind of overarching narrative or kind of story that are linking them all together. I mean, currently there are papers regarding that we need this kind of overarching objective. I don't know whether you've heard of it, this thing called Half Earth or Nature Needs Half. It's a very kind of bold objective that says that we should set aside half of Earth for nature, basically. I can see that it is good to have kind of an overarching, very easy to understand objective. I acknowledge the benefits of economic valuation and I have done some projects on them, but as an ecologist, I know there's a lot of things that can't be valued economically. And one of the things people have been looking into is kind of functional traits for like soil, uh, like earthworms, etc., soil organisms, or macroinvertebrates in the river. I was interested previously in looking at functional traits. So people traditionally look at um, species as an ecologist, so how many species there is in the ecosystem. But what people have been finding in ecology is that functional traits are important. So their body size, uh, are they decomposers, or what kind of specific thing the insect does in decomposition. And the research has been suggesting that we should be more concerned when a whole functional group goes extinct, because then the services can't be provided. I've got a small case study, I would say, in China. Mm. So the lake system I worked on in China, it's uh, the third largest freshwater lake in China. There's about four or five major cities around the lake. And what happened was there was so much pollution and urbanization going around the lake that in 2007, people in one city had no access to tap water for about four or five days because there was a blue-green algae bloom, basically. The, the lake constantly has blue-green algae bloom. And it was only then, I think, the government realized that oh, this is a really serious issue because they had to provide bottled water to the community for about four or five days. There was price inflation in the supermarkets in bottled water. And then they had to get people to clean the decomposing algae in the lake as well. So the whole massive event cost them, I think, billions of dollars to actually clean up. And what some of the scientists later suggested is part of the reason could have been because a lot of the wetlands were reclaimed around the lake and the wetlands were destroyed. And if the wetlands had still remained as a buffer system for taking the pollutants out, then perhaps they wouldn't have spent so much money trying to you know, mitigate the risk after it happened. So I think with companies as well, they are looking at how do we prevent the risk from happening rather than let it happen and then it will cost us a lot of money to actually repair the damage that's been done. Our research is suggesting there's multiple forms of value and not just economic value. And I think in terms of changing people's perspectives or businesses or policymakers, I don't think necessarily monetary valuation of either natural capital or ecosystem services is going to do it. I think there has to be like a change in people's values and opinions, like inherently. We're trying to, I would say, improve the framework of natural capital concepts. Mm. So natural capital, essentially, I think the value that's coming out from there is instrumental value, basically. Kind of physical values we can understand, like providing water, providing food, etc. But there is also, like I said, with the intrinsic value. So biodiversity, I think, has an intrinsic value you know, despite whether we are here or not, that it does have a type of value. And lastly, which is this new type of value which is coming up, is called relational values. So how humans relate with na nature, 
and kind of how we make decisions about nature, either from kind of a moral or ethical perspective, regardless of whether nature has economic value. This kind of moral ethical imperative to protect nature, I think sometimes it does apply to even businesses. So a lot of businesses, they kind of want to have a good image. And part of that good image is kind of doing environmental sustainability work. Uh, so that's why I think natural capital and ecosystem services currently is resonating quite heavily with a lot of the business sectors. As a traditional ecologist, I got into this because I love nature. Hmm. But obviously, working in China, I can see that the traditional approach was not working. A lot of businesses they might not want to deal with biodiversity because even for scientists, it's quite a complex concept. We need to work out a way that they need to be aware that biodiversity is important for their sustainable business. Previously, I did work with our local ecological knowledge in China and uh, the research kind of proved that uh, we had a lot of experts going out to a remote region trying to find an endangered species and we couldn't find them. But uh, I interviewed a lot of the ethnic minorities <laughs> around there and uh, they, they said, oh, we saw that species like two weeks ago in that river. And uh, they helped me to map out where they'd seen the species and it helped us to find the species, basically. There is a lot of different subject areas of research that needs to be done. And that includes not only natural scientists, but also social scientists, economists, accountants, even philosophers. So... Uh, so obviously, you know, as a, a young ecologist mm. many years ago, my lecturers, you know, taught about kind of connectivity within the landscape. Uh, there's no point in setting aside, you know, national parks or no-go zones if there's no connectivity, if there's no corridors between them. It's kind of threshold values, that they have been set for biodiversity. I mean, there has been one which is generally kind of 11%, 12% of terrestrial areas should be, you know, protected as national parks. But actually, the 10, even the 10, 11% one, it wasn't based on scientific evidence. It was based on many years ago in America, they decided that was, this sounded like a good number to protect national parks. And I think the current scientific evidence is showing that, you know, even like 11%, which we're not hitting anyway, in some areas, is probably not enough. Hence why that moved on to the half earth kind of hypothesis, the, the kind of idea. I think urban ecology is also a very important research area and that you can't only consider the ones in national parks but also the fact with urbanisation that people are losing their connectivity to nature. So even if we end up protecting everything in the national parks but if everything is so urbanised then children are not, you know, uh, they're not exposed to nature, they're losing connectivity to nature. They just like pl playing computer games and they don't see the point in protecting nature. But I think in the future, it still won't work. Yeah, hi, so my name's Paul Jepson. I've been a conservationist all my life. I'm currently working for a progressive consultancy called EcoSulis and I moved into the enterprise sector just recently actually after 12 years directing master's courses in the School of Geography at Oxford University and prior to that I was a practitioner working for bird life in Indonesia and I started my career in urban conservation in, uh, in Manchester and Shrewsbury in the UK. We now realise that there's a big role for enterprise in rewilding, landscape restoration. There's a new area which I'm involved in, which we're developing, which is working at the intersection of landscape recovery, technology and finance. The configuration of conservation environmentalism does need to change. But if you all work together, you're more than the sum of the parts. Really, if we're going to have change, we need to you know, increase the employment market, if you like. Uh, that's not happening with NGOs. But with technology and, and actually more distributed organisational types and ways of working, there's a real opportunity for, for enterprise there. We can work for, in an entrepreneurial way for, for nature and the environment in many different sectors. And for me, the, the future and the influence comes from informal networks, 
connecting different organisational types in different sectors. Working with clients, it's really looking at co-designing solutions with them, bringing the creative thinking, which is encapsulated within rewilding, into those conversations. There's a number of different ways of, of thinking about um, rewilding. I mean, my favourite is that it's just um, it's just a label, a label like maybe the labels hippie or punk or whatever, which signify an unsettling, a sort of reassessment of where we are, maybe a desire to shape up the future. But rewilding is doing that in terms of how we think about nature conservation, our relationship with the environment and so forth. So one way of thinking about it is just that new opportunity for people to engage and um, shape futures, shape futures of uh, nature, the environment, our engagement with it. This is sort of talking a little bit from a Western European perspective, but a lot of our nature conservation has been focused on protecting, conserving benchmark uh, ecosystems or habitats, as particular assemblages of plants, specific types of woodland or grassland or so forth. Or it's been about protecting declining species and so forth. So a lot of it has been focused on elements, units of nature and particular identities of nature. It's enabled strong law, clear policy targets, management targets and, and so forth. I think this particularly long-term ecology and the advances in that science, which have been enabled by technology, we've come to understand past ecosystems much better and come to understand that across much of the world, including Western Europe, grasslands and large herbivore assemblages or mixed wood pastures were the norm. And they supported huge diversity and had great resilience and all of these uh, sort of things. But actually, millennia ago, Humans wiped out uh, a lot of the big megafauna, or we domesticated it. And that actually we've been living in a world where we've internalised ecological impoverishment, both in our culture and in our institutions and in our conservation policy. There isn't one nature, there isn't a pristine nature, that there's multiple past natures. What would happen if, to the extent we can, we reassemble in Europe the large herbivore assemblies? So things which have been divided, like, you know, we only know cattle and horses in the domestic livestock farming. Uh, we still have deer in the wild realm. What happens if we just reassemble them all together? There were some very pioneering experiments of this in the Netherlands. It was quite extraordinary what is happening when this idea of rewilding is, is put into play. Amazing kickbacks of, of nature, rebounds of nature, habitats or smaller ecosystems like freshwater ecosystems appearing in places which we never knew them, species which we thought were rare, suddenly returning in abundance, and much more dynamic natures. Thing. That's the sort of the scientific conservation identity of rewilding. And then I suppose when we say, well, what does rewilding mean? It means different things to different people. The term originated in North America. And their rewilding was much more tied up with concepts of wilderness and maybe pristinity and bringing wolves back and top-down trophic cascades. In Western Europe, the version of rewilding which I'm involved in is, is a very pragmatic version, which says actually if we're recovering and restoring nature, we can't go backwards, we can only go forwards, so that the, the rewilding natures that emerge will be different from anything we've ever known before, but they'll be equally as wonderful as nature before. But if we are shaping natures, we can actually shape those natures to solve current problems. So there's a very sort of integrated form of, of rewilding emerging in continental Europe. For instance, on the Dutch Delta, with climate change, there's increased rain events, pulses of water coming down these huge rivers. But by taking out summer dikes, buying up agricultural land in a very pragmatic way, using the silt for brick building to re restore this sort of natural river braiding and channeling, bringing in natural grazing, so bringing in herds of, of wilded horses, cattle, deer, introducing beavers again, recreating those large mammal assemblies in these areas. You're getting incredible nature, but um, cities and companies are ben benefiting from lower flood um, management and insurance costs. The, the construction industry be benefited from having a source of, uh, of bricks. People have benefited from just having great areas where you can go and hang out and uh, have a nice time at weekends. And then there's tertiary tourism economies 
building off that. So you're getting these really lovely new systems starting to emerge. Another example of a nature-based solution with rewilding, you know, this pragmatic European version would be Spain and Portugal, again, climate change adaptation. At the centre of the Iberian Peninsula is getting drier. There's rural depopulation, which is a loss of traditional herding. This is increasing biomass. That's leading to intensity of wildfires, which, my goodness, what a problem. But actually doing rewilding and bringing in natural grazing again, you reduce biomass load. So you reduce the intensity of wildfires and then you get you can either use them as natural areas for tourism and sort of wilderness type areas, or you could do sort of new pastoralist type um, economies on it. So perhaps what distinguishes us as a, a species on the, on this planet is the fact that we have this third reality where a lot of what we do and how we act and how we think is shaped by narratives and stories and language and so forth. And many of these narratives, they, you know, they develop over time, they sediment over time, but they really do shape how we think and how we, yeah, how we move ahead and, and how we relate to each other, of course, as well, which I think is important. We developed a narrative of nature and our relationship with environment, which was a really powerful narrative and it's achieved much. But it actually is a very cautious and protectionist narrative, such that we always sort of wanted to put nature out there and separate and fragile. Maybe people who, colleagues in other sectors, architecture, urban development, industry or whatever, they haven't really seen nature as a force which we can engage with to shape futures or shape place-based futures. It's almost seen something as a bit, oh, it's under threat. We need to put it aside or, or whatever. In rewilding, we're seeing a different narrative emerging there, that that a narrative of empowerment. This is where we're at. We can't go back. There's not a lot of point in blaming people. Let's just start doing something to make things better. And then these narrative elements, they often talk about pioneer action or people getting together and, and through this, starting to reassess how we might do things, values, worldviews, and then bringing people on board and this sort of momentum so it's a much more of an interactive uh, narrative from which emerges stories of, of wellness, I suppose, so adaptation. A word which comes to my mind, which you've heard, is this notion of offsetting. You know, we offset harm. So companies do this, you know, they're offsetting their carbon footprint, they're doing biodiversity offsets, and that's one way to do it, saying, well, okay, you know, we just feel a bit bad about things, so we'll we'll try and offset our impact elsewhere. Okay, fine. But again, it's not saying, well, you know what? I don't want to feel bad for it. I want to be, contribute to a better vision. And I want to be part of change. And many, you know, I think that's what many people want. I woke up one morning, it's a narrative of recovery just was in my head. Ate my breakfast quickly, jumped on my bike, whizzed down into the university and got onto the academic search engines and just started putting narrative of recovery into web of science. And out popped this, uh, I mean, not a massive amount of literature, but these papers on mental health recovery. I think the crucial thing which really grabbed me in, in the link between these narratives and the narratives I was hearing in, in rewilding all this new environmentalism is rather than pressuring others to act on our behalf, which is part of the classic campaigning thing of environmentalism, it was really like, you know, you can't wait for a national health service or the doctors to sort yourself out. Just sooner or later, you've got to start taking responsibility for your own health. And that's the always the epiphany people have. And then you start engaging, you start acting, you start beginning, just getting together and starting to make projects happen and finding that, that new way, that wellness, that recovery uh, in it. So it's really interesting, the term rewilding and how this you know, its original ideas were more associated with classic sort of U.S. wilderness ideas. These ideas in Holland started under the term nature development, which was a sort of technocratic policy. And then the term rewilding has been applied to them or, you know, we're talking about semantics, the, the re prefix. It can either, you know, it's Latin origins. It can either mean back or again. And, and that's really interesting, that difference. So what we're finding is that some people immediately see it as going back, you know, going back to a sort of more wilderness, fortress conservation way, outside people telling people what to do. But actually, but in this European one, it's, it's really using the re as again. So we can refine engagements with nature, connections with nature. And it's really interesting when, when you look at all of the re-words, which 
the European rewilding seems to align with. So you could say that the way we use urban regeneration, regenerating urban areas is nothing like, you know, you don't go backwards, it's always going forward. They look quite different. Recovery, in a sense, uh, you recover from a bad injury, you might not ever be the same again, but you're recovered. How do we think about um, recovering Earth systems of which we're part? Part of it is the big international agreements and policies, but part of it is just, just people getting going on things in their areas, in their competences, in their places, and, and through that, getting this sort of bottom-up momentum. We have a framework called the Natural Asset Framework. For me, capital you know, it's quite a linear type of thinking often capitals. We think about capitals and then they can create flows, you know, so whether it be labor, money or natural resources can be an input into a production service. And sometimes it's a bit divisive as well. And it sort of gives um, prominence or preeminence to economic logics, whereas assets Assets are actually a lot more meaningful, I think, to people. So, you know, example I use is with culture, with human assets, with infrastructural assets, with institutional assets. And that's what creates a, a natural asset. And some of those assets are already here. But we can think about restoring, recovering, creating new natural assets and new natural assets which are part of that place building or place rejuvenation, regeneration, whatever we, uh, whatever we want to call it. You know, one of these nice things about the rewilding logic, it sort of releases you from baselines. You take inspiration from past natures to shape future natures. You're not trying to recreate something. So that then creates space for different groups to come together and to think about what forms of natural asset they may want and where those natural assets uh, may be. I'll give the example in the Netherlands that they needed new natural assets along their rivers to adapt to climate change or whatever. It might be um, in other areas that people are you know, looking for new natural assets to have somewhere to go dog walking, you know, which is quite popular in the UK, or have to, somewhere to have a wild experience, ha have somewhere which produces food in a more a healthier and more ethical way. I think the dream client is somebody who had or could create some space where you could do something pioneering. Contained areas where you're doing something new, where you're experimenting, just trying out things new and people can come and talk about them. They can bring in people who are sort of more progressive change agent can get involved in them. They can be used as exemplars for adoption in wider society. I'm talking about innovation hubs for nature a dialogue way, a co-design way of changing and bringing about new environmental, new nat natural futures, pioneer, demonstration, experimental project approach. I think it's a good way of, yeah, co-design. I think maybe that's the word, co-production of environmental futures. We've outlined a set of rewilding principles. So sort of guiding principles, which aren't prescriptive, but they, they sort of characterise what rewilding is. So the fundamental of restoring ecological dynamics and processes, taking inspirations from past natures to shape the futures, working with restored forces of nature. One of the things we do know from, you know, from theory, you know, Anderson's Imagine and Communities is that nature, that nature is very good at place branding and giving this sense of nature and this sense of territory and sense of community and belonging. <laughs> One of the interesting things is if, if they're novel, uh, the new natures which we're creating, which they are if you know, we're reassembling large herbivores and, and abiotic diamonds. So if they're not protected by nature conservation legislation because they don't fit with that, so you know, the, the more they become these free spaces. And actually, you can be much more relaxed about what people do in them. And again, this is happening in, in the Netherlands where, if you like, the, um, the most famous site, Gelderse Port, people are allowed just to do whatever they want in it. And of course, the interesting thing is because it's dynamic and wild and there's big stuff walking around, most people tend to keep to the paths. <laughs> you become human again, you know, sort of like, oh, a bit scared. Nobody's telling you what to do. And if you want to go off, I mean, I did this once, if you want to go in and go off, off the footpaths and go in and get dirty and look for beavers and have a bit of an adventure, you can do it. But there's very few people who do that. We're in an increasingly regulated society, whatever the merits of it, there's much more health and safety. We're told to look after ourselves, there's all of this. The opportunity just to get out into natural areas in your town where you can just do what you want.
social norms rather than regulations. I mean, that that sounds to me to be valuable. <laughs> it, it is an interesting thing about nature is that once you start helping it recover, it says thanks so fast. Nature does have a force. In the 1990s, I worked in Indonesia and um, I set up the BirdLife International Program there. And for the first part, I was working out in eastern Indonesia on parrot conservation and so forth. But then actually after I've left that job, I started working as a consultant, uh, mostly with the World Bank and a couple of NGOs on, on the Sumatran frontier. And it was a pretty hard time in some ways that well, two or three things were going on, really. What One is, you know, you go to a forest area and you go six months late, later and the landscape was totally, totally trashed and, and trashed in almost um, down these roads, dirt roads, and there's swampy areas with just these skeletons of trees stood out. It was a bit harrowing, actually, I realised. I mean, at the time, I was sort of in this professional eye, you know, doing this sort of way, but it, it, it was getting to me. Partly, maybe, it also got to me because I'd had such magical times in my backpacker days in tropical rainforests, just feeling the aesthetic of it and the beauty of it and the, the wonder of it. You know, just feeling this being lost and being lost for... <sighs> it's the frontier. But then the other thing which really got me was two other things, really. One was um, the chaos, you know, international NGOs working at ministerial level, World Bank, and this realisation that we had no control over the chaos of the frontier, just out of control, big NGOs sort of dropping off, off the real active engagement with the ground. Uh, well, I was listening to a bit to Radiohead, but I hadn't actually listened to OK Computer, and uh, someone said, oh, you should listen to this, and it just became the soundtrack of my life and anybody who knows the okay computer album will just know those sort of wailing crescendos and then these really rock you know hard guitar riffs in it and it just became the soundtrack of my life i think if i'm going to be honest i realized that that period i was i moved into a bad place Blah. teaching the, the students then started talking back to us as not just me as, as lecturers and saying look we don't want to hear all of this you know all the evidence about the decline of nature and biodiversity loss and blah diddy blah you know we know things are in a bad way we don't want to be a future where we're just defending the inevitable and you know these images of Sumatra <laughs> coming in my mind you know we want theory and ideas and learning so that we can shape the future and then as part of that I started looking outwards and I found the work going on in the Netherlands and I started taking field trips out there and then, you know, came into this, it doesn't all have to be like the Sumatran frontier. Even, even though we may trash things, there is still opportunities for nature to recover and to work on nature recovery. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nordic by Nature on Narratives. You can find out more information on our guests and a transcript of this podcast on imaginarylife.net slash podcast. And follow us on Instagram at Nordic by Nature podcast. Many thanks to our guests. You can find Tom Crompton on commoncausefoundation.org. Paul Allen is at the Centre for Alternative Technology on cat.org.uk. You can contact Dr. Yuan Pan through the Geography Department at Cambridge University in the UK. Her research into natural capital was with Professor Bhaskar Vera at the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. Please see cambridgeconservation.org or contact the Natural Capital Hub for more information into natural capital as well as organisation and company toolkits. Paul Jepson is currently Nature Recovery Lead at the consultancy EcoSulis. Their website is ecosulis.co.uk. That's E-C-O-S-U-L-I-S 
www.rjrostogi.co.uk. You can contact RJ Rostogi via foundnature.org, where you can read about his work at the Foundation for the Contemplation of Nature. You can also follow the Foundation on Facebook and Contemplation of Nature on Instagram. The music and sound has been arranged by Diego Losa. You can find Diego on diegolosa.blogspot.com. Please help us by sharing a link to this episode with the hashtag Traces of North. We'd love to hear your thoughts on our podcast, so please don't hesitate to email me, Tanya, on nordicbynature at gmail.com.